Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program today, The Power of Personal Stories. My name is Julia Thompson, and I am the Education Program Manager at the Holocaust Center. For those of you used to seeing our wonderful Director of Education, Alana Cohn Kennedy at Lunch and Learns, don't worry, Alana is doing great. She'll be returning at future programs. Last week, when violence erupted at our nation's capital, symbols of mess and messages of hate, including those that reference the Holocaust, were given a platform unlike perhaps any other in recent American history. Here at the Holocaust Center, we believe the painful arc of history, especially when expressed through personal, emotional, and relatable stories of individuals does have the power to change minds. Our mission, our mission is to teach the lessons of the Holocaust, inspiring students of all ages to confront bigotry and indifference, promote human dignity, and take action. Survivors' experiences have always been an integral piece of impactful Holocaust education. As you will hear from today's panelists, teaching and learning about the Holocaust with such accounts inspire people of all ages throughout our community. I couldn't be more pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Rawan Arar, who I am grateful to have begun a collaboration with almost a year ago, as well as our panelists briefly. Dr. Arar received her PhD in sociology from the University of California, San Diego. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Law, Societies and Justice at the University of Washington. And her research includes refugee studies, international migration, and genocide among many topics. Our panelists today alongside her are Dr. David Marcus, grandson of a Holocaust survivor and a postdoctoral scholar in neuroscience at UW, students from Dr. Arar's Genocide and the Law course, Gia Valentine, Mackie Freeman, and Ella Muniza, and finally, Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau members, Charlotte Wolheim, Peter Metzelar, and Aggie Day. Charlotte grew up in Aschaffenburg, Germany, and escaped to the United States shortly before the war broke out. Pete, a Dutch survivor, was in hiding on a farm and other locations, as well as passing as a non-Jewish boy. Aggie was a hidden child in convents in Hungary and elsewhere during the war. A big thank you to the University of Washington Strom Center for Jewish Studies, our community partner on this program. Thanks also to the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund for sponsoring the 2021 Lunch and Learn series. Our generous supporters make progr programs like this possible. And you too can support our Lunch and Learns by becoming a member of the Holocaust Center for Humanity today. We acknowledge that the Holocaust Center in downtown Seattle sits on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The Duwamish are a people who are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website starting tomorrow. The views, information, or opinions expressed in this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. Thank you all. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rawan Arar to continue our program. Thank you, Julia, for that introduction. And thank you all for tuning in today to um, be a part of this project and uh, share with us um, the things that we did in our class. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction about what our class was, what the students learned over a 10 week period and how that culminated in students um, doing interviews and having conversations with survivors from the Seattle Holocaust Center. So as Julia mentioned, this project um, in collaboration with the Holocaust Center uh, was part of this 10 week course where we reviewed five different cases of genocide. Students started by learning about the Armenian genocide, um, asking what's in the name, what's in a name, thinking about the politics of genocide denial. 
We then talked about the relationship between colonialism and genocide, reading excerpts from Dunbar Ortiz's An Indigenous People's History of the United States. We then moved on to talking about the Holocaust with Doris Bergen's War and Genocide, thinking about the relationship between race and space and the role of racialization in perpetuating genocide. After that, we discussed the Rwandan genocide, especially focusing on uh, the experience of women during times of war, reading excerpts from Marie Berry's book. Finally, we talked about genocide in Cambodia and focused on Lu Luang Ong's uh, memoir, First They Killed My Father. And so over this 10 week course, students had an opportunity to learn about genocides um, in different parts of the world and, and through time. However, there's still something about hearing from and speaking to people who have survived genocide that will teach students about these very important issues and these questions that they can't necessarily get from a book or a film or a movie or a podcast. And so the goal of this class, one of the goals of this class was to introduce students to people who were affected by the issues that we were talking about. As we were learning more about the Holocaust, we had um, Dr. David Marcus join our class twice. He started first by coming into class and talking about his uh, grandmother's story, Hannah Marcus. Then students watched the, Hannah Marcus's testimony um, and, and discussed it with um, Dr. Marcus who then joined our class again. And so we start off today's um, presentation uh, with a conversation with David Marcus. Hi, David, thank hey. you for, for joining us today. And thank you for all of your contributions to our class. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get us started with a, a question about your um, experience in, in terms of participating in this class. What was it like to teach students and share with students your own family's story and be in conversation with them as they learned from Hannah Marcus and her testimony? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for the opportunity to share this story with everybody. And thanks for everybody at the Holocaust Center, as well as the survivors today for putting this event together. I, I have to say, when I was first asked to share this with the class, I was pretty intimidated. Um, you know, I'm, I'm far from a scholar in the Holocaust. And I, you know, I kind of read through your syllabus a little bit and had a reasonably good idea that everybody in your class had at least as good of a knowledge of the Holocaust as me, if not better. So I did feel a little out of my depth. Um, on the other hand, I was really, you know, grateful, proud, verklempt maybe to be able to share my grandma's story with a bunch of new people. You know, she, she passed away about four years ago. Um, and on a personal level, I, I just, I really like the idea that more people kind of got to know her a little bit and, you know, in, in that way, get to preserve her memory and preserve her legacy. So that, you know, made me feel really good on a personal level, but maybe more germane to what we're talking about today. You know, I think throughout her story, there are multiple lessons to be learned and multiple opportunities for instruction and maybe allows us to learn a greater understanding about what happened during the Holocaust. You know, I, I think when we read in a textbook and, you know, see the number 6 million, we don't, we aren't really able to understand what that number means. You know, we can't compute a number that high. We've never seen 6 million of anything, but you know, when sharing a personal story, there are multiple moments, multiple things that people can latch onto that are meaningful to them and, you know, have the opportunity to have instruction. So, and I think what was so striking to me is that almost everybody in the class, one of the prompts you had was, you know, what, what kind of what is the most salient, what's the most relevant thing or most, you know, meaningful thing that you got out of this. And almost everybody had a different answer, you know, whether it was her best friend growing up saying, we can't be friends anymore, I'm joining the Hitler Youth, her dad being kidnapped on Kristallnacht, her being reunited with her long lost brother in full American military uniform after not seeing him for a decade. Um, every, everybody kind of grabbed on to something different. And I, I think that just kind of shows the power of these personal stories that, it, 
you know, everybody is able to find something salient, something memorable that they can take with them. Um, that, and I, I think that's incredibly important to keeping this in people's mind and keeping the memory of what happened alive. Um, and I, I think more talking about kind of current events, one of the prompts that I had when I first talked to the class was, so this was back in December, this is before everything that's happened in the past week. Um, one of the prompts that I had is what is something that has happened in the past four years or what is something worrying that you've seen that has happened in the past four years that kind of relates to the buildup to what happened to my grandma, you know, what sort of, what is the political or social world that allowed this to happen? And I think, you know, the events of the last week have, at least for me, really solidified my fears seeing Confederate Nazi white supremacist symbols in the American capital. I, I think it's important now more than ever that we really double down on Holocaust education and make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. So I think this was just an incredible opportunity for teaching and instruction. And yeah, I, I, I was blown away um, by how meaningful this was to me and you know I, how much I think the students got out of it. Thank you for, for sharing those reflections, David. Um, you are reminding me of after um, speaking to you, after speaking to the students, one thing that you said that, that struck me that I'd like to share with um, people who are tuning in today is also how students were picked up on, on aspects of Hannah's story that just um, reflected who she was as a person. And I, I think that there's so much um, to be said about connecting to the person in order to learn about these events. Because um, I think that this kind of, of learning is what really will have an effect on um, students as they're, they're learning about genocide and the Holocaust. So thank you so much for, for those uh, comments. Um, I'd like to um, now invite our first pairing of um, student and survivors who uh, conducted their, their interview or had this conversation. Um, we're going to start off by talking to Gia and Charlotte. So Gia and Charlotte, can you please join us? Hi. Okay. <laughs> Hi, how are y'all doing today? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start off with a question for Gia, um, and, and these will be the same questions that I ask from um, one pairing to the next. Um, my first question for you, Gia, is um, will you please tell me about some important takeaways from your conversation with Charlotte, and um, what, what did you learn from hearing her personal story? Yeah, I think some of the most important takeaways I took from my interview with Charlotte was really just to focus on the present. Um, to really find the joy and anywhere you can in life. She talked to me a lot about like appreciating the support from your family and friends, not taking that for granted. Um, I think that holding on to the people in your life while you still have the chance was something that I really got from that. Um, and just being grateful for the people in your life who you're surrounded by and appreciating them. Um, I also learned a lot about how everyone's experience of genocide is really different, but everyone's story is really important. Um, I also think that during this class, we had a lot of content that was really hard to watch and really hard to read. And I think that hearing Charlotte's story kind of at the end of that was something that I really needed to hear. She has such an optimistic outlook on life. And I think that it really gave me a well-rounded kind of balance at the end of this class. Um, yeah, it was just something that I really needed to hear. It was very inspiring. She's such a positive person and it was, it was just something that really stuck with me. So. Thank you, Gia, for sharing your experience with us. I, I now want to turn to Charlotte. So um, Charlotte, will, will you please tell us why do you share your personal story? You know, I think Winston Churchill said it a lot better than I can. Uh, those that failed from history are to repeat it. And we certainly got a taste of that very recently with what was happening in Washington. Uh, his, there are aspects of history that are important lessons 
which we dare not forget. And that, and also I feel I'm honoring those who perished by trying to keep them alive through my telling their story. Thank you, Charlotte. Is there anything, Gia, from Charlotte's story in, in particular that you think stayed with you or that um, allowed you to um, understand more fully the things that we talked about in our class? So much. Um, but Dr. Marcus touched on this a little bit, how it's really hard to fully grasp how drastic events were just by getting kind of a vague and broad understanding of what happened. And I think that her personal story just allowed me to envision personal events so much better and gave me a much better understanding of how people were actually affected. Um, she talked a lot about how she was in um, like a boarding school with her sister for two years, separated from her parents. Um, that was something that was really important. Um, also, her father was arrested several times. Uh, I talked to her a little bit about the kind of feeling of pride that she had for some of the things that he did. Um, it's just, it's really interesting to hear someone's per, like personal stories of their family and how that helps them get through genocide. So. Thank you, Gia. Um, and Charlotte, what was the conversation like for you with Gia? Um, did you feel like uh, having that conversation, um, like what, what did that mean to you to have that conversation with her? Uh, I'm always, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm always heartened by the interest and the hope that is engendered in me when I see these young people who take the time to study history and attempt to learn from it. And it keeps me hopeful that with them, the future will be brighter. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, okay, let's now move on to talking to our next pairing of uh, students and student and survivor. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mackie and Pete. Are we on? Yes, you are on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, thank you. Great, okay, I'm going to start with the same questions that um, I just posed to Charlotte and Gia. Um, and Mackie, I, I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about the takeaways from your conversation with Peter um, and, and what it meant to hear a personal story. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, first of all, I was kind of pleasantly surprised that the interview ended up being such a um, kind of informal conversation, but it was also very uh, genuine, I think, and honest. You know, Peter's easy to talk to, and it was definitely interesting to hear firsthand that kind of personal narrative. Um, and so I think the nature of that kind of conversation definitely reminded me that these survivors, despite um, their incredible stories of survival and everything they've lived through are still, um, you know, normal, almost everyday people that have families and, and lives that continue on after the genocide as well. And um, so for me, I think it was really helpful to see that through Pete's eyes, um, you know, the progression of events that occurred before and after a genocide. Um, and I saw how important it was to also center those experiences of survivors around um, how we understand the history of genocide as well. Um, so I think, but for one major takeaway, I would say, um, I, I actually got to ask Pete this question as well. What was one thing that, you know, us as a younger generation should take um, from an interview like this? And, um, so I'll just refer to what he said, and it was to have awareness and be an independent thinker. And I think the reason why he said that was because in our conversation, we talked a lot about how, um, you know, there's issues that we are dealing with today that are kind of similar to things that were happening 
uh, from what Pete lived through. And that's in terms of culture and politics, similar to what David was talking about earlier. Um, and so I think it, it's been helpful for me to contextualize uh, modern day events in that sense and keep in mind how these patterns do repeat themselves and how it's important to learn from people who have experienced it firsthand so that we can prevent things like that from happening again in the future. Thank you, Mackie, for, for sharing that experience. And now, Pete, I'd like to turn to you and ask you the question, why do you share your story? And um, what was what did you get out of this conversation with Mackie? Well, I often have to state that uh, my, my message is an independence, independent story. Uh, after the Nazis occupied the Netherlands <clears throat> in my time, it was over five years later, I happened to be in the 20% of those Jews who did not, did, who did not get murdered by the Nazis. 80% uh, did. And the important thing that I always emphasize is it's a lesson in history. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. And that is to set the facts straight, to accept truth, and to research falsehood, especially in the world that we have today, where they're even surprising to me every time I hear of such a thing, that there are so-called deniers of this horrible event that happens to be in history, one of the greatest events. The thing that made it so great was the mere fact that it was documented and recorded. So for those who deny it, there's really no ground to stand on uh, whatsoever. Uh, it, I always like to emphasize that emphasis, I mean, to emphasize the fact of independent thought called the world, uh, you know, we, we, always, we always tend to go, most of us tend to go along with the flow, not necessarily uh, always in our beliefs. You know, the world as we, as we have created it is a product of our thinking and it can't be changed without changing our thinking. So, you know, to stand by and do nothing is just not an option. And to have the opportunity to speak to various groups from the eighth grade on to the university, to senior church groups, uh, it's, it's, it's an honor. It's really an honor for me uh, to do so. One thing that I can say, because so many of the talks over the 20 years I've been doing that, uh, do involve the middle, uh, middle grade and high school grade. And that comparison to a group of students on a university level, the one thing that I have to say that those kids in the middle and high school, they are after learning a few aspects of that part of history that is very foreign to them, they're told, listen, tomorrow we got an assembly and you show up and be there and we got a speaker talking about this subject versus your folks uh, on the university level, you have chosen, you have chosen to look into this subject. And so that becomes a lot more meaningful in the long run. And we're, we're very honored to be able to learn from you uh, as well. So thank you for meeting with Mackie and, and for sharing um, your experiences. And, um, and thank you, Mackie, for um, sharing what that was like for you as well. Um, we will circle back around to this during the, the Q&A and, and hopefully get to elaborate more on this idea. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, Mackie's final paper um, focused so much on, on knowledge production. And I think that that has a lot to do with um, Pete, what you just said about facts and what does it mean to document um, and, and how, you know, especially since we talked a lot about genocide denial in our class, what it means to actually keep track of these things so that they, they can't be denied in the future. So thank you so much. We'll come back to talking more about this in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to invite our, our final uh, couple. Um, 
if I can please have um, uh, Ella and Aggie uh, come to the stage, the Zoom stage here. How are you both doing today? I'm doing well. So uh, well, Ella, let me start with you. Um, and, and I'm going to pose the same question to you that I've been posing to the other students, um, which is, um, what was an important takeaway from your conversation with Aggie and, and what does it mean to you to be able to um, hear Aggie's story and put that in context with the other um, things that we were reading and learning in our class? Um, it, to answer that last question, it meant a lot and I was just gonna reiterate how thankful I am as a young student for the partnership between the center and the university that you helped develop as a professor. Um, not a lot of classes go that extra step to have you talk to people about their lived experience with the issues you're studying. Um, you know, in my conversation with Aggie, kind of echoing what Dr. Marcus said at the beginning is like students will latch on to different things and different things from one person's story will stand out um, differently to everyone. And with Aggie, um, her perspective um, that she shared with me, I remember at one point I asked her about, you know, how did you understand, um, did you understand what was going on because you were so young as a child in hiding? And she shared with me this very specific answer about, no, I didn't understand, but I knew what I had to do because I was a child of war. And then she began to explain to me, um, you know, think about all the children today that grow up in conflict zones or grow up in these situations where um, you have to just know what you need to do to live at such a young age. And that wasn't a perspective that I had considered. It wasn't a perspective that had overtly come up in the class material before then. And so I think it really stuck out to me. And then the final thing that really I drew from with the interview with Aggie is I chose in the class to try and take a long perspective at looking at you know, how a genocide begins, the little things that start to change that lead up to what we think of as an atrocious event, you know? Um, and then also, you know, how do people heal from it in the end? And in my interview with Aggie, um, we really covered like the story of her family after the genocide and what recovery and family meant then. And those were the two things that I really drew from and just felt very thankful to have learned about. Thank you, Ella. It's it's so um, interesting to see how each student learns different things, um, not only based on, on who they're having conversations with, but about the topics that really resonate with them as well, and that resonate with the person they're speaking to. So um, I'd like to turn to you now, Aggie, and, and pose the question, why do you share your story? And what was this conversation with Ella like for you? Well, first of all, Thank you, Ella, and it was a delight meeting her. And um, for me, I probably have to repeat what uh, Peter and Charlotte said, uh, but what's so important is to perpetuate um, and keep in mind and let people know um, what happened during the Holocaust. And in general, the Holocaust being one of many, many, except being huge and probably more people killed during that time than other genocides, um, but they're all horrible. And to teach people, teach young people uh, what can happen when they, the small, the small uh, feelings of not fe feeling different and, and not accepting the differences, that's how things start. And so I am privileged because I am one of, the survivors to impart that information. So the reason I'm doing this in the classrooms is to continue that teaching and let people know, let young people know that it's so important that even though we have differences, we are all the same. And you know, I, I close my uh, presentations with something that John Kennedy said at a commencement exercise. And in a way that encapsulates my basic reason for doing that. And basically that we are all the same, even though we have differences underneath, we are all the same blood and the same skin. Doesn't matter if it's a different color. It doesn't matter if we practice a different religion. 
yes, we're all different, but underneath, we're all human beings, we're all the same. And we have to understand that. And what John F. Kennedy says is that we do inherit this small planet together, and we do all breathe the same air. And we have to remember that. And again, touching on what just happened last week, um, we, people forget that. And I think that's important to remember. And that's really the reason that I am very happy and proud to um, represent the story that I tell of my, my past during, as a hidden child during the Holocaust. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that, Aggie. And I, I hope that during the Q&A, we'll also continue to um, explore further some of the topics that, that you brought up and that Ella brought up. Um, I'd now like to invite back all of our panelists so that we can take questions and, and answers um, and expand upon the topics that we've discussed. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple questions that have already been um, posed to us, but as I, I read these off, um, I'd also like to invite people who are tuning in to also please um, send us your questions so that um, our, our panel can respond to them. So um, if you just give me a moment here as I look through these. So, um, Here's one question. It looks like it's from Carol. Um, during the lifetime of these students, the past survivor, the, the survivors may pass away. Given how important it is to hear the survivors' stories um, and to hear from them, how can this impact what they carry forward? So I suppose this is a question also um, for the students mainly, um, but maybe I can uh, expand upon it to say, to ask what the survivors would like that the students do carry forward. Um, and I'll just open it up for our panel to respond to that. Go ahead, Aki. Well, I mean, I guess that, that, that is the reason, yes. We're all obviously a certain age and yes, we're going to pass away. So that is sort of the reason. In fact, the Holocaust Center has now many, um, as um, Dr. Marcus said, <clears throat> um, telling a little bit of his grandmother. And so the Holocaust Center actually has quite a few people who aren't obviously Holocaust survivors, but their children or grandchildren are Holocaust survivors. And that's what's so important. And just for myself, I know I've passed this story on, um, aside from being videoed and so on, to my grandchildren, and that's what's important to perpetuate that, uh, because you're right, we're not going to, the person's right, we're not going to be around forever. And I guess that's why it's meaningful that when an original Holocaust survivor can say, tell the story to someone, it really has a meaning that's uh, beyond anything else. I'd like to comment on something here. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> The important thing I personally recognize when I speak to youngsters that it is very difficult not, to begin with it's a difficult subject no matter what but to convey what can happen uh, to youngsters to an event that happened so long ago uh, is a difficult thing and I always I always keep you know keep that in mind and what I like to really convey to them that not poor little me, poor little what we went through, all those poor Jewish people, of course, that is all part of it. But how does that relate to them in their lives today? And there's so many comparisons. Uh, we have to look at only recent history as most of us are bringing up and that they can identify and not necessarily accept what Uncle Charlie or Aunt Tilly says or whomever, but to look it up, to research, uh, to not go along with propaganda, which is so powerful. Propaganda is so unbelievably powerful. You know, the Germans weren't exactly stupid people, but they had, you know, Joseph Goebbels, you know, Goebbels was 
a part of, of, of the regime to do only one thing, and that is to spew out propaganda. And people have youngsters, I hope to always relate to that. They have to recognize it, look it up, research it, and find out for yourself what in fact is propaganda and what is truth and stay with the truth. Yeah, I see you nodding. Did you want to, to add your take? Hmm? Um, well, I mean, he's absolutely right. And again, we I don't know how much we should spend on what happened last week, but that's exactly what's going on right now, unfortunately, in our country. Um, untruths being spewed over and over and over again. And I think the addition of social media right now, which was not available um, during our hol the Holocaust that we speak of, but now I think because of social media, things can get, uh, information can get dis dis dissipated so much more quickly. And unfortunately, the propaganda that Pete speaks of is being sort of going all over and people do believe, people believe, people don't research. People don't look up to see what is the truth, what is not. Unfortunately, people want to, a lot of people want to just believe what they hear and then just piggyback on that and go on with their uh, beliefs and spewing them and unfortunately doing some really negative, the negative impact, which we're right now feeling in our, in our United States today from what happened last week. Thank you, Aggie. I'd just like to add one very short thing, if I may. Of course. Uh, recognize the educational system uh, through which survivors and descendants of survivors relate the story of history. We have to be cognizant of the fact that in the United States at this moment, there are only 16 states that mandate the teaching of the Holocaust. Uh, through the efforts of the Holocaust Center for Humanity here, we hope and in the very near future that Washington State becomes another one. But what I'm leading up to, that in Germany, the Holocaust has been mandated to be taught since yes. the 80s. Since the 80s, this is Germany. They have to live with this fact for the rest of their lives. So the importance of relating uh, has to come through the educational system in, in our country here. Thank you, Pete. That's a, a point that we actually talked a lot about in class. And so I'm going to ask some students to respond to it and also include another question from um, members of, of our audience. Um, this, this statement I suppose to respond to is, I'm curious how both students and Holocaust survivors alike feel about the importance of documenting the experience of survivors of other genocides around the world. So um, if I can, I can turn to the students now and talk about, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about how, how important it is to document and then how important it is to learn um, and, and what gets taught in schools, especially um, when we were talking about genocide denial. Are there any insights from, from the conversations you've had or from class that you would like to share with our audience? Go ahead, Ella. Yeah, I would love to speak on this question. Um, so how do I feel about the importance of documenting people's stories um, strongly in favor of it? Um, but more importantly, uh, whose stories get told. So that's something that we really touched on in this class is um, history books are written by uh, the winners or they're often written by those with a lot of power. Um, and so whose voices get heard can really skew what narratives are told. And that's why we can see, um, you know, genocide denial happen a lot of the time or um, kind of history be written to support the narrative of kind of the teller. Um, and, you know, what I think needs to be taught in schools is more comprehensive and it includes voices from more people of different backgrounds. And 
one thing we specifically touched upon in our class to speak off of what uh, Peter said was, you know, he talked about how the Holocaust is mandated material in Germany. Um, well, the, the genocide that occurred on, you know, Native American and American Indian individuals on our lands is not mandated material in our country. And we talked a lot about that, about how, you know, the narrative of how our country is founded is taught to us when we're in elementary and middle school and how it was like this great conquest and what's left out of the story and whose voices aren't told. Um, so that was a big takeaway for me from the class and something that I, I would say I pay a lot more attention to now on whose voices are shared and, you know, what I'm taking in. Can I have, oh, Mackie, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just going to add that uh, one other aspect of that in regards to whose voices we're listening to when we're studying genocides is um, one thing that I hadn't considered, but we covered in the class was the kinds of genocides that are still occurring today and um, the voices that are still not being heard, like Ella mentioned, um, in America, I mean, you could say, well, it is a fact that the genocide against Native Americans and um, indigenous people is still occurring based on, um, you know, the the same standards that we would apply to any other genocide. And also, um, when we're thinking about the voices that we listen to, I think um, it is important to go back to survivors because of that, because it, it's so often um, almost so incredible to believe the story when it's happening. Like for example, we talked about in the Cambodian genocide, um, the, the stories that were coming out of that were so unheard of and so horrific. And um, it was almost uh, difficult to believe the survivors. And for other reasons, you know, their stories weren't heard and action wasn't taken uh, at the time when it, it could have been most helpful. And so thinking about the things that are still occurring to this day um, and the genocides that are still happening every day. Um, we definitely have to think about the, the voices that are being ignored right now. Thank you, Mackie. Um, Gia, it looks like you, you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, I was gonna add that um, in Domland, which we watched this quarter about the Native American genocide, a big theme of that was the more people who share their stories, the more people who want to come forward, the more people who come forward, you're not only building a community, but you're educating people. And those were kind of the, the two themes that um, went along with beginning the process of healing and not passing on like intergenerational trauma, um, which I thought was just really important. Thank you, Gia. I think that that point really connects well with uh, Lindsay De Palma's question here in the panel. Um, she poses this to um, the survivors who spoke to students. She asks, how has reception of your story fluctuated over the years? And if it has fluctuated, um, and uh, why do you personally think that that reception has changed? Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, I don't in my personal experience, it has not changed. A lot depends on the ages of the students I'm addressing as to what questions the sophistication level of their understanding and uh, therefore their ability to ask questions. But I have not found any change. I can add to that. Uh, through the years, I have not found it either that there is a change that for those of us telling our story, uh, most of us, I'll speak for myself, stated from memory as we walk through the events as we can remember them. But it goes, I think, back to those people, as difficult as those stories are, as difficult as genocide, the Holocaust. To understand it, you get so many of those so-called deniers who are, let's be real, racist, they're bigots. And you always hear, well, in my opinion, it just didn't happen or it was exaggerated and so forth. Well, 
you know, living in the country, do we do? I guess we we do have a right to our opinion. But to those people that voice that opinion, don't make it a fact. Don't make it a fact, because facts are born on have to be based on documentation, on reality. So one of the things I always do very much was slight differences in my presentation that whatever I do speak about, I wanna make sure that it is correct because all we have to do is state one incorrect statement and those people, those deniers, they see he was wrong about that. He's wrong, to, you know, they're wrong about the whole thing. So that's a very, very important thing. And I, I try to do my best to stick to the facts. Um, basically the same thing, I really, my uh, it, the audience reception has not fluctuated. And Charlotte, I totally agree um, that uh, it depends on the sophistication and the age of the group that you're speaking to. Um, and it's interesting, but uh, again, with that in mind, each uh, it's interesting to see how the individual uh, spectator, not spectators, audience that listen to you, different things of say my story, when I tell it, there are different aspects of it that impact um, people. And I find that really interesting. Certain things that you wouldn't think, that I wouldn't think maybe impact somebody, really impact people a great deal. And for example, when Ella, Ella was really impacted by the fact that, worry, that I was able to, with my family and so many survivors, go on to lead a very, quote, normal life and impact a normal childhood to their children, because not all survivors have been able to do that. A lot of times Holocaust survivors, um, families, the second generation suffer from the, have suffered from the impact of the first generation because a lot of Holocaust survivors have found it extremely, extremely difficult to speak about their experiences. And because of that, that has impacted their families, their children in a very negative way. And so I know Ella uh, was very um, impressed and happy to hear that say my, and I am happy to say that my family was not impacted that way. Um, by speaking about things the way my mother was able to speak to my children, for example, was very, very helpful for them. That's all. Thank you, Aggie. Um, I have a, another, question here. Um, let's see. So um, Julia is, is asking about what did students learn from each other's projects learn uh, in, in their conversations with other survivors? Um, if I can just open that up to the students. And I also want to invite uh, David as well to talk about what he learned from um, the students as well. Uh, Gia, would you like to get us started? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we all did presentations on our interviews and then we were able to watch each other's presentations and respond to that. Um, I think, it was really, really good because we not only heard a lot of detail from the person that we personally interviewed, but we got kind of an overview of a lot of the other students' interviews. Um, I'm just trying to remember a little bit about each person's presentation because there was just so much. Um, I remember Ella specifically, I thought it was really impressive how Ella was bringing some of her own major, like um, discussing nutrition and healing. Um, that was another thing was everyone kind of had a different perspective on healing and their experience after genocide. I think that everyone also touched on the fact that genocide doesn't really end, um, which is kind of a core theme in our class. Um, and it was really good to hear everyone's perspectives on how, like when genocide ends and how the kind of trauma or healing is different for everybody else. I didn't get to hear anybody else's um, stories, but you know, even within people's comments on my Nana's story, um, some people picked up on things that I 
hadn't even, you know, I've seen it a few times now. Um, and one of the ones that was most striking to me was, it was, it was near the end, they, they were kind of going through old photos that she had and she was describing the photos. And one of them was um, my great grandfather um, in a German military uniform. He was a World War I veteran from, um, actually maybe it was Ella who, who said that, but I, I forget exactly, yeah, it was you, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, and, and just the comment that in less than a 20 year span, he went from being a lauded military veteran to an enemy of the state and just how quickly that progression happened and how scary that is and how quickly these things, if, if left unchecked, how quickly these things can progress. So I thought that was just a really interesting observation and just, and a little frightening too. Ella, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, I just, I remember my comment on that and it was, um, the idea I think in the presentation where she talked about your your grandmother talked about um re-meeting her brother in full U.S. military like garb and then compared to the picture of her um grandfather and that within those generations so much could have changed like who people from the same family were fighting for and why um yeah I remember making that comment I also just I loved getting to see to return to the original question, everyone else's presentations. And what's interesting is we all kind of knew um, what each other were focusing on for kind of our final projects. And people would kind of address that, say, oh, my, my interviewee brought up something around um, childhood or my interviewee brought up something around narrative production. And, um, and I'm not good with specific examples, but I remember us all kind of helping each other out and collaborating and really sharing that information. Um, so I know someone, yeah shared with me um, something from their interview that had to do with um, the role of like culture and food within that family because that's what I focused on um, and how that is taken away during a genocide um, and it was just so helpful and at the same time you got to learn so much more than you would have if you were just on your own. Thank you Ella. You know we started this conversation, Ju Julia started off this conversation making connections to the events that have um, just happened uh, in the last week. And throughout our class, we talked extensively about race and racialization and um, how that contributes to not, not just genocide in terms of a, a nebulous event, but the process, the progression of genocide. Um, there are so many questions here, at least two or three from the audience connecting what happened um, most recently um, with the insurrection uh, to what you're learning and the state of our nation right now. And so I feel like I, I need to open that up to the audience as well to comment on, um, because of course, our study of genocide, our study of the Holocaust is happening right now. Um, and so there's no way that we can separate this investigation and our study from the things that are happening um, in our world today. Would anybody like to comment on these connections? Well, I guess just basically, um, we have to be very, very careful because how did the Holocaust begin in Germany? Um, there are a lot of different uh, similarities between what's happening and what happened um, last Wednesday. And unfortunately, if you start studying the Holocaust and you look into what's happened last Wednesday and what is happening even now, um, as people are defending their actions and defending their speeches, you can really unfortunately draw a big similarity. And this is what we have to be so careful of because you can see history repeating itself. Um, now, of course, this is, well, basically that's it. I mean, you have to just watch because this is what's going on right now. And this is how things begin. And if allowed to fester, they'll continue. Thank you. Thank you, Aggie. Um, 
Pete, I'm going to give you the last word, and then uh, Julia is going to going to come in after your comments. Quickly, I also am aware of the fact that when I do my presentation, especially with adults, uh, to some degree, you got to be really little careful, and you walk a thin line when you get into politics, because you're basically as speakers and representing the Holocaust we're talking about our personal experience. And no doubt, we all know that there is a tie to today, but that is a thin line when you start getting into politics and open up a whole different can of worms. Thank you, Pete. Um, that, that, we, that could be the start of a whole nother uh, panel discussion. Um, maybe that's something we can do in the future is talk about this relationship between how do we talk about um, events of the past and uh, what's happening today. Um, I think one, one way that we worked on thinking through and navigating contemporary politics and class is really looking at the progression as Aggie was pointing out. So if we can think about how these things build up over time, then we can also not only search for um, connections that are very specific, but also uh, identify junctures of intervention as well. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Julia back to our panel, who's going to um, wrap up our conversation. Thank you so much, Rawan, all the panelists for sharing your insights. Um, I think this was a really um, different sort of discourse that we could um, bring into the Holocaust Center's virtual space today. Um, and I just really appreciate um, all of your time. And I also want to thank the attendees for joining, of course. Um, a big thank you to Michelle Quinones for providing closed captioning. Um, I'll also remind everyone that this program has been recorded and you will find it on our website starting tomorrow along with our other past lunch and learns. Um, I'll just express a huge thank you to uh, my colleagues at the Holocaust Center, Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who makes all of this magic on Zoom work behind the scenes. Thank you to our Executive Director, Dee Simon, and all of our other staff members, Alana Cohn-Kennedy, Nicole Bella, Lori Warshall-Cohen, Amanda Davis, Paul Regelbrug, Rosa Campos, Sydney Dreitel, Ellie Selesky, Rick Brewer, Morgan Romero, and Katie Lawrence. Please consider joining us next Tuesday at noon for a Lunch and Learn featuring Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau member Charlotte Wolheim, who you got just a taste of her story today. She'll be sharing her personal story and presentation in full, including her childhood in Nazi Germany, memories of Kristallnacht and her escape to the United States. Um, I wish you all a great rest of the day. Stay safe and be well. This concludes our program today.